.50 caliber that shaped the Cold War. From NATO tanks to Soviet convoys and insurgent pickup trucks, these heavy machine guns changed how nations fought across continents. Today, I'm breaking down every major .50 caliber of the era, how they worked, why they spread, and the firepower they brought to global conflict. If you love clarity and chaos, subscribe and dive in. The Browning M2HB was the foundation of Western heavy firepower. Even though it was designed in the 1920s, it dominated Cold War arsenals because nothing matched its balance of power, reliability, and range. It fired the .50 BMG cartridge, capable of penetrating light armor, fortifications, and aircraft skin at long distances. The gun's recoil operated design and thick construction allowed it to fire thousands of rounds with minimal maintenance. In Korea, the M2HB was mounted on tanks, half-tracks, aircraft, and fixed defensive positions. During Vietnam, it became a signature weapon on UH-1 helicopters, Riverine patrol boats, armored convoys, and perimeter bunkers. Its stability and accuracy made it ideal for sustained suppressive fire in jungle environments and open terrain. NATO countries standardized around the M2HB to simplify logistics. Canada, West Germany, the UK, France, Italy, and Japan all integrated it into their vehicles and naval platforms. Japan manufactured its own licensed version through Sumitomo, ensuring long-term availability and parts production. By the 1980s, the M2HB was installed on nearly every major NATO armored vehicle, from reconnaissance jeeps to main battle tanks. The Soviet DSHK was the Eastern Bloc's answer to the M2HB. It fired the 12.7 by 108 mm cartridge, slightly longer and higher velocity than .50 BMG. This gave it excellent penetration against vehicles, aircraft, and fortified positions. Its gas-operated mechanism and large cooling fins helped it survive long firing sessions without overheating. The DSHK saw heavy use in Korea, where Chinese and North Korean forces used it for anti-aircraft fire and to counter U.S. vehicles. In Vietnam, the DSHK was a major threat to American helicopters. Hidden in the jungle canopy, it could strike Hueys during approach and departure, forcing pilots to adapt flight patterns to avoid predictable attack routes. The weapon became a symbol of insurgent warfare because the USSR supplied it widely. It armed forces in Angola, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and numerous liberation movements. Mounted on tripods, armored trucks, or improvised technicals, the DSHK delivered long-range stopping power that smaller weapons couldn't match. Its ruggedness allowed it to operate in deserts, mountains, and humid environments with minimal maintenance, one of the reasons it remains in service today. Introduced in the early 1970s, the NSV replaced the older DSHK on many Soviet platforms. It fired the same 12.7 by 108 mm cartridge, but used a lighter design with a stamped steel receiver, cutting weight dramatically compared to the bulky DSHK. This made it far easier to mount on tanks, armored personnel carriers, and infantry tripods. The NSV's higher rate of fire, around 700 to 800 rounds per minute, gave it stronger anti-air and anti-personnel performance. It became the standard commander's machine gun on T-72 tanks, where it could be aimed easily from inside the turret. In the Soviet-Afghan war, the NSV's mobility and speed made it well-suited for convoy escorts and defensive positions along mountain passes. Its relatively low recoil for its power improved accuracy at long ranges. Warsaw Pact nations adopted it quickly. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria manufactured their own versions or imported Soviet units. After the Cold War, the NS-5 continued service across Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and numerous post-Soviet militaries. China developed its heavy machine guns by copying and improving Soviet designs. The Type 54 was a near-identical reproduction of the DSHK, manufactured with slightly simplified components to suit Chinese mass production. It fired the same 12.7 by 10 to the 8th millimeter round and maintained the same battlefield role, 
anti-aircraft, anti-vehicle, and infantry support. China exported the Type 54 extensively. It equipped North Vietnamese anti-aircraft units, Pakistani border forces, African liberation movements, and Middle Eastern armies. The mass availability of the Type 54 made it one of the most widely distributed heavy machine guns of the Cold War. China later introduced the Type 85, which replaced heavy components with lighter stamped parts. The gun weighed less, was easier to carry, and had a more user-friendly tripod. Designed for large-scale export, it became common in conflict zones from the Horn of Africa to the Middle East. Today, Type 85s remain in production and continue appearing in modern insurgencies. Yugoslavia, maintaining independence from both NATO and the Warsaw Pact, built its own heavy machine gun, the M87. Chambered in 12.7 by 108 mm, it borrowed design elements from the Soviet NSV but incorporated Yugoslav manufacturing methods and materials. The M87 served on armored vehicles, border defenses, and infantry tripods. Though not exported on the scale of Soviet or Chinese guns, it became a major battlefield weapon in the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s. Its durability and familiarity made it valuable across the various factions that fought during the breakup of Yugoslavia. As of today, it remains in service with several Balkan militaries. Western Europe relied heavily on U.S. heavy machine gun designs rather than creating new ones. Standardizing on the Browning M2HB simplified ammunition supply, shared training, and vehicle design. West Germany integrated the M2HB into its armored fleet as it rebuilt the Bundeswehr. France replaced earlier 13.2 mm naval guns and standardized around the M2HB for land and naval forces. The UK used the M2HB on armored vehicles, naval mounts, and static air defense positions. This unified approach allowed NATO forces to maintain consistent firepower across multinational operations. Ammunition storage, repair facilities, and spare parts depots could all support a single system, strengthening NATO's logistical backbone. France entered the Cold War with stocks of 13.2 mm Hotchkiss heavy machine guns from World War II. These guns served primarily on warships, colonial garrisons, and fortifications. While powerful for their era, they lacked modernization, rapid production capability, and compatibility with NATO ammunition. As France reintegrated into NATO weapons standards, the Hotchkiss guns were phased out. The M2HB replaced them, offering greater reliability, a simpler supply chain, and compatibility with NATO logistics. Heavy machine guns remained essential in aviation roles even as jet technology advanced. The M2HB appeared as a door gun on UH-1 Hueys, CH-47 Chinooks, and other helicopters during Vietnam. Its ability to deliver accurate, high-volume fire while airborne made it a core part of U.S. air mobility tactics. The faster-firing M3 variant equipped air defense mounts, helicopter doors, and fixed gun pods. American AC-47 gunships famously used multiple .50 caliber guns to deliver continuous fire patterns against ground targets. Soviet helicopters similarly relied on heavy machine guns. The Mi-8 and Mi-17 frequently mounted DSHKs or NSV derivatives for escort and fire support missions. These weapons were crucial for protecting transport helicopters flying low in mountainous terrain. Heavy machine guns also served on early Cold War aircraft as defensive guns before rapid-fire autocannons took over. Their final aviation role centered on close air support, convoy protection, and suppressing ambushes. While NATO stuck to .50 BMG, the Soviet Union supplemented its 12.7 mm guns with more powerful 14.5 mm systems, especially the KPV. The 14.5 by 114 mm cartridge had far greater penetration, capable of defeating armored personnel carriers and lightly armored vehicles at long range. However, the Soviets didn't replace 12.7 mm guns. Instead, they used both calibers strategically. 
14.5 mm for vehicle mounted heavy firepower and anti aircraft rolls, and 12.7 mm for infantry, static defense, and lighter vehicles. This dual caliber approach gave the Soviet military flexibility across all types of terrain and conflict. One reason the M2HB became so universally adopted was the strength of NATO logistics. Standardized ammunition, 0.50 BMG, shared spare parts and unified training programs allowed NATO armies to operate efficiently together. The U.S. also exported M2HBS and ammunition through military aid programs across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Many countries with limited industrial capacity adopted it simply because parts and training were cheap and abundant. By the late Cold War, the M2HB wasn't just a NATO gun, it was a global one. Cold War proxy conflicts showcased the real impact of heavy machine guns. In Vietnam, the M2HB defended American helicopters and bases, while DSHKS and Chinese Type 54s challenged U.S. air mobility. In the Middle East, Israeli, Arab, and Lebanese forces all employed .50 caliber or 12.7 millimeter guns in urban and desert fighting. In Africa, technical trucks armed with heavy machine guns defined modern guerrilla warfare. A single DSHK or Type 85 mounted on a pickup could dominate open terrain and destroy vehicles, making these guns essential for irregular forces. In Afghanistan, the DSHK became a hallmark of the Mujahideen. Its long range allowed fighters to strike Soviet helicopters and convoys from mountainsides, influencing Soviet tactics throughout the war. That was the evolution of every 50 caliber machine gun that powered the Cold War. Decades later, these weapons still shape today's battlefields because nothing has replaced their mix of range, reliability, and raw force. If you want more deep dive breakdowns on the weapons that changed history, hit subscribe, drop a comment telling me what to cover next, and I'll see you in the next one.